Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And today we're going to move into some of these bomber airplanes again. And we're going to go all the way into a throwback, Greg. We did the A6, which was a very effective modern strike airplane, attack airplane for the Navy. We're going back to the big humma That is a technical term, the B-25. The B-25 was a North American product. It was one of the most versatile bombers used in World War II. It actually, Greg, flew to Shangri-La. But before I go any further, as you can see, Greg has outfitted me I, with, I, I, when I saw this and he produced this today, because Greg picks the hats, I was literally speechless. So today, as you could see, I'm Maleficent. I think I got that right, Greg. From my Zoetic assistant, and he has normally picked the hats today. I guess, Greg, because I'm with Mitch the Witch, which, by the way, is a historic nose art, right, from World War II. I guess I'm... Uh, I'm, <laughs> I don't even know what to describe this. It is a little bit frightening, but uh, Greg has always picks the hat. So I'm going to get this off camera to Greg here. This one actually has a little mass to it with those horns. There we go. A nice catch by the Kenny. Now we're dealing with the North American, the B-25. First flight was in 1940. It was introduced in just in time for World War II in 1941 and it was retired in 1979. That was something I did the research on this airplane. 1979, Greg, in, in, by the Indonesian Air Force was the last that it flew, so that was kind of interesting. Now it had some interesting variants. It had the AT-24 trainer, the F-10, and the PBJ-1, which were all versions of this airplane, and we're gonna talk about that, but first I'm gonna pick up my model here, and I got a bit, this is another, Greg, you're just outdoing yourself on models. This is a, another really nice model here. Um, it, it, has, it has a couple of variations. We're gonna talk, we're not gonna get too deep into variants in this airplane, but we are going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about how versatile this attack airplane was, a versatile bomber, but it, um, so it was introduced in uh, 1941, just in time for World War II. The United States was, of course, the winds of war, Greg, were on the horizon. I'm not talking about the book. The winds of war were on the horizon. And the United States was, I wouldn't say frantically, but they knew everybody thought they were going to get dragged into uh, World War II. And so we were coming up. We've talked about those all-metal low, all low-wing monoplanes. We were coming up with, of course, the B-17. The B-25, now the B-25 uh, comes out of a 1939 Army uh, Air Force specification for a, a uh, attack or a medium level bomber. Um, it was developed from the NA-40 and the XB-21, and it was developed later into, and Greg can throw up an image of this, the XB-28. Now the XB-28, there were only two copies built and uh, it never went anywhere, but that is a direct derivative of the B-25. Now, uh, in testing, the airplane had, and this is a little bit of a, a little, I wouldn't say a Fred fun fact, but they had to play with the dihedral on the wing, and they had to do that because the wing had, in the early prototypes, had wing flutter. It was, in, it was unstable, and if Greg can, well, first of all, I'll give you a plan view of the airplane. Greg can throw up a plan view. When Greg throws up the plan view, you see that the airplane has a little bit of a gold wing or a drop at the wing. That was actually the first 10 airplanes that they did in the, in the early testing phase all had wing problems and they made the change to that wing. One of which was tying that wing down a little bit, flattening the wing and, and that little gold dip there is designed uh, to solve that problem, the instability problem, which it did. Now there's one thing about this airplane that you have to be careful of if you're the future B-25 pilot out there is that some planes will have, and we've talked about the term a long time ago, coffin corner, right? 
and coffin corner was if you're in a formation and you're out on the end, the enemy came in and shot you. Uh, there's also a coffin corner in high speed airplanes, but this also had a, this could be a widow maker, right? It could send you to your coffin. And that was, if you lost an engine on takeoff, at a certain point in takeoff, this airplane, even with the design that was finished and rolled out, this airplane will, to this day, roll over on you. Meet the B-25, the Billy Mitchell. She's built for low-level, torpedo, and long-range-level bombing. From now on, she's your ship. You'll want to know her like the back of your hand. So grab a chute pack and we'll try her out. Now go the plane with your brakes and open the throttles to take off power. When you're sure you have it, release your brakes quickly and you shoot away like a rocket. You're loaded right now to about 26,000 pounds gross weight. So keep an eye on that speed indicator and when it reaches 102 miles per hour, pull firmly back on the stick and climb your plane at about 115 miles per hour range. Before beginning to climb, it's smart to keep your nose down until a safe single engine flying speed of about 140 miles per hour is reached. Meanwhile, the pilot reduces manifold pressure to 38 inches and the co-pilot reduces RPM to 2400. As you rise above 800 feet, retract your wing flaps. Bring them up gradually. That way you won't settle or lose altitude. So it does have some squirrely flight characteristics, but it was a very, very effective aircraft. And pilots are trained how to fly the airplane. But it's interesting that you think about when you design something that most aircraft are designed and, and the challenges you have, right, are takeoff and landing primarily with airplanes. Uh, but that they would design an airplane even when they fix the wing issue that had a, if you lost power, it could, if it was fully loaded. And a lot of these early World War II bombers were like that. If, if they were fully loaded and you were going out and you lost power, you had a problem, uh, you were, as I've always said, you're in for a really bad day. And in this airplane, it had that little design flaw. So the other Fred fun fact, Greg, I'm gonna throw out a Fred fun fact. Did you know that North American made the most aircraft in World War II? across all platforms, if you think about that. I'll let you figure that out at home. But the North American made the most aircraft in World War II because they had a whole bunch of different types, if you think about it, under production at the same time. Now, everybody knows about the Doolittle Raid and that the Doolittle Raid was, uh, they sacrificed the airplanes. Af this is after Pearl Harbor. We had to strike back against Japan. We're not gonna spend a lot of, the Doolittle Raid has been done backwards, forwards, and sideways. Um, and that essentially was to make a, a statement. The crews and the aircraft ultimately knew that uh, it could potentially be a one-way mission, but it was so important that the United States make a statement to Imperial Japan that Japan was not invulnerable. And by the way, what a preview of things to come with Imperial Japan and the devastating uh, air attacks that ultimately happened once the the Japanese kind of defensive sphere in the Pacific collapsed as the United States Navy came fully in and Army Air Force came fully in the war and ultimately we know the war ended with that bright flash from that B-29 with an atomic bomb. Now the B-25 was interesting this one and Greg can show armament variants of the airplane. This one has a solid nose and it has those, um, those 50 caliber machine guns. You could see a combination with a 20 millimeter cannon. This aircraft has cheek packs on it, so you could have the cheek packs. Now, why did you do that? Well, you did that because the B-25, remember in the Pacific, we're fighting down lower. We're fighting much lower than we were fighting in Europe, and these aircraft were essentially down on the deck, right? What are they going after? Well, they're going after ground targets, they're going after shipping, which interdiction on shipping was uh, pretty amazing. Open bombay doors. Open bombay doors. Prepare to bomb. Prepare to bomb.
Submarine bombing demands greater accuracy than any other. It calls for an almost direct hit in order to be effective. That takes nerve, skill, perfect coordination. That takes split-second timing, deadly aim. Pretty amazing. They weren't doing a lot of close air support because the Navy and the Army Air Corps with their airplanes, as we island hop, were providing close air support. But these aircraft would prove more and more to be going after uh, aerodromes, airports, and, and disrupting Japanese airfield operations, and then just trying to just blow up their railways, bridges, uh, uh, supply ships, you name it, these airplanes went after. And when you start converging that many, we've talked about the kinetic energy of the Madu, so the 50 caliber machine gun. When you converge that much lead out in front of the airplane with a high rate of fire coming out and converging at a point, which is how these weapons were designed or whether they were aimed, they were converging on a point. They have proven that this aircraft could sink a Japanese destroyer. Because remember, you just got to punch a hole in the water line, you're going to sink it. Now, the other thing that they would do is in interdiction is they would drop bombs out of here and they learned how to skip bomb the bombs into the ships. And so they would come in incredibly low, skip bomb, drop the bombs. And I've seen, and I don't know whether, Greg, you can find pictures of the bombs up above the wing of the airplane where they're skipping the bomb into the target. They could skip bomb. There's also a whole bunch of pictures of these aircraft attacking um, Japanese airfields with uh, parachute retarded bombs, with bombs that would, but they're doing it all at low level. And remember we talked about it like with the A6 and all those airplanes coming down. When you're at low level, you only, as an anti-aircraft gunner, as a AAA gunner, you only have a shot as the airplane crosses over you or you put that, uh, that lead up and you hope that the airplane flies through it. But low altitude, is very, very good with these airplanes. They were flown in Europe with Catch-22 and, and all over Europe and in all medium bomber roles, but I would say th that they were most devastating in the Pacific against the Japanese supply network. Greg, amazingly, there were even, even some of these aircraft that had a 75 millimeter cannon built into them. I've talked to Army Air Corps veterans that actually flew these that had a 75. And they would fire the 75 and they would come back and see how many rivets were missing in the airplane because the concussion from firing the airplane was so violent. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put this down without breaking it. This is a really cool model, but Greg, but I have a feeling it is a little fragile. So today we are going with, Greg has got another interesting stage two for me today. This is, I, I, here I come to save the day. It looks like Mighty Mouse Soda. Uh, it actually says that. It's from Golden Records Soda, which I have no idea who they are. Uh, an American classic. This is Blue Cream Soda, an American classic. I see Greg is wafting his arms out there. He's obviously referring to the airplane, an American classic. Am I right? Did I get it? Okay, I'm good. I'm, I'm picking up on his visual cues here because, you know, we're going to get Greg on the other side of the camera here one of these days. So uh, what I want to do today is I'm going to salute, and if you're a B-25 bomber pilot during World War II, you need to reach out to us and give us a call. I want to hear from you. If you can, call us. We'd love to hear from you. But what a difficult job being a medium bomber pilot, whether you were in a B-25 or any of those other medium bombers. You're going in, they kind of fly like a fighter, but you're going in against flak and fighters and probably not as much fighter support as the heavy guys are getting. 
those B-17s, B-24s, and uh, you got to go out there and you got to get down in the mud, so to speak, and, and hit that target. So to all of the medium bomber pilots during World War II, I salute you. You know, Greg, and it's 170 calories. There's no expiration date on it, but it's cold at least this time, so that's kind of nice. I'm going to take my second. This isn't bad. I may keep this one. After two months, Greg, you, you've got a keeper. This isn't a gastric disaster. I'm going to hold on to this one. It's knock down the 170 calories before somebody takes it out of my hand. So the, um, the airplane was incredibly versatile. Uh, it was used in all theaters. It had a, a secondary life after the war. A number of them, Greg, were turned into fire bombers. They were turned into executive coaches. These airplanes were disposed of incredibly cheaply after the war. And so you could get them and you could convert them. You could do all kinds of different things. So you could use it as your executive coach. They were used as VIP transports in the military as well. So it was a logical tra uh, trans you know, move over from that. Um, but they, they also became fire bombers. Um, people that fly them love them. They're still B-25s. You go to air shows, people love them. Uh, they fly at air shows. They've flown off aircraft carriers for movies, modern airplane carriers, you know, aircraft carriers for, uh, for some of these Doolittle movies and stuff. People absolutely love this airplane. We actually have one that comes in, uh, Pacific Princess, that does our flower drop. So this aircraft is under heavy maintenance right now. We're going through everything, the carbs, props, the everything. Uh, and it is going, uh, Mitch the Witch is under deep maintenance. We're getting ready to, to run it up. So we're, we're working on that. Now one thing, people ask me, what are these aircraft most comparable to in the Axis inventory? I get that periodically. The two airplanes that I would say they're most comparable to are the JU-188, which was a high-speed German bomber and the Japanese Helen, the KI-49, are probably the two most comparable aircraft in the Axis inventory, but they weren't built in anywhere near the numbers uh, that, the, uh, that this particular aircraft was produced. So it's very prolific. What's its legacy? Probably the, although the medium bomber in, in the inventory is gone, uh, and you know what, Greg, I'd stick my neck out and probably say, I know this is crazy, but probably the F-117. If you think about a limited payload, it's not a heavy bomber. Uh, I'm not talking about the technology piece, but it's got to go in, it's got to hit a specific target, and it's got to get out. Uh, you could equivalent uh, some, of the, uh, some of the Navy attack airplanes. Uh, maybe the A-10 might be another one, but that's more of a close air support airplane. But these types of medium crewed bombers, are they're long gone. They ended... Uh, in the mid-50s, uh, and really that's where they petered out. But the idea, the concept of medium strike goes on. Now, I'm going to take, Greg, I, I'm loving this soda here. My goodness. This might be a two-hour video as I finish my soda. Now, you, if you're interested at home in building your own B-25, Greg builds these, as I've said before. He flies them around the office. You can pick up this B-25 for you or a young person of your choice to actually build this. It's, these are a lot of fun. We can send that out from the gift shop. Or one of the great things we have is this really, really cool World War II shirt. It has a B-25, but it's got all the cool uh, American airplanes uh, that were in World War II, and you may want to wear that. I like the color. The weight on it is good. And that is something that you might want to go out and pick up because I think it's really exciting uh, to have. I love wearing this stuff. Uh, in fact, you know, one thing is find a, a uh, something, a T-shirt in my wardrobe that doesn't have a logo on it anymore. It, it's a real challenge. So, uh, so I got to say, I wear all this stuff myself. But I want to thank you for joining us today. Remember, like us on uh, YouTube, uh, subscribe on our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook. This is a classic example of us in a maintenance 
uh, area of working on these airplanes. We cannot do that maintenance without your donation. So go out to our donation page and slap a donation in there. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.